Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Deanna Minnick with Harmony Hill Retreat Center, and we are here to talk about the holidays and all the eating events that go on during this time. So this webinar is dedicated to healthy tips and recipes for the holiday season. So what I'll do is talk about various tips that you can engage in and, and really start to put into motion in these next couple of weeks as we head through the holidays. And then also we will talk about recipes, um, which are always quite fun. And I'll give you some, some tidbits and some things that you might want to think about including into your holiday meals. So why are we focused on the holidays as it relates to eating? Well, uh, what we know about this time is that it's unlike the rest of the year for us, right? It's, it's very unusual, this, this six-week time frame uh, between uh, late November into um, early January. And according to a Weight Watchers report, what we know is that the average American gains around 7 to 10 pounds between Thanksgiving and New Year's Day. So keep in mind that is, again, just six weeks, but there can be so many changes that happen. It's very atypical compared to the rest of our year. So why is it important to even focus on eating healthy during the holidays? Well, for a number of different reasons. Um, during this time, for those of us that are in the Northern Hemisphere, the weather is changing. So it's colder outside. Um, we are, we're more engaged with uh, the holidays and having that distraction, trying to juggle everything, um, going to social events and eating different foods that we may not be accustomed to eating. So we might be more prone to illness. This is where you start to hear about people getting colds and flus and coughing and sneezing and not feeling so good in their belly. They might have more bloating and that might come from the things that we aren't usually accustomed to eating. So this combination with the stress, the high fat, high sugar foods that we may not always be used to eating is a, it may be a recipe for illness. Uh, not for everybody, but uh, we, we might start to see some changes there, right? So that's why I thought we would talk about holiday tips. What are some of the basic things that you can do in order to really ensure that your holidays will move smoothly and, and really flow and give you that sense of joy and satisfaction without having all of the uh, the illness, the stress, and um, of course we're all going to fall off and probably eat some things that we, we normally wouldn't, so we'll fall off track there a bit. But if we are really creating a good foundation and we're aware of certain things that we can do during this time, then we might help to buffer some of those effects. So the first holiday tip is to reduce stress and embrace relaxation. And of course that sounds a lot easier than it is. <laughs> but um, if you look at stress in general, 80 to 90 percent of diseases and symptoms have some connection to stress. So even though it sounds overwhelming, to really tackle that in some way, even if it's small, will be valuable. So studies show that around this time, around the holiday period, there are more heart issues, and heart issues, whether it's a heart attack, um, cardiovascular, um, whether blood pressure goes up, you know, that could be from a number of different reasons. And of course, our, our heart responds to emotional reasons as well to different foods that we're taking in. So for that reason alone, uh, especially if you, you need to watch your heart health, um, you, you definitely want to be aware of the stress in your environment and any kind of overindulgence in certain foods, being aware of the, the weather and, and how you're interacting with all of that. So there are lots of ideas for managing stress in a positive way. And you get to choose, of course, your favorite variety of stress reduction. So that could be relaxation techniques, lifestyle strategies, exercise, sleep, and nutrients. And I'm just briefly going to take you into each of these so that you have some ideas. I think what really helps is if you have certain things front and center, whether you write it down, whether it's one little thing, you can make a ripple effect in the rest of your life. So let's um, go through some of these ideas. 
So relaxation techniques, and I'm only going to talk about four, but there are many. Um, one of them has to do with our breathing. So as the weather gets colder, we might tend to breathe more shallow. You know, we're feeling kind of constricted. So really getting deep and in, um, breathing into our belly and having that what we call diaphragmatic breathing. So breathing deep, what that does is it helps to calm us. It's changing our nervous system activity. So even if you're out shopping, uh, you know, you're driving around, this is something that everybody can do, right? It's just, uh, it, it involves having to make the space for it and to create the attention but it's something that we can do in the moment, whether we're at a shopping mall, a grocery store, we're on the busy roads, uh, at a stoplight, uh, we're at home, we're in the kitchen, wherever we are, we can breathe. So that's one thing that might appeal to you. Um, the other one is progressive relaxation. So that's just a fancy term for essentially where you lie down and you, you tighten up your muscles initially and then you let go progressively, kind of one muscle at a time. And it kind of feels like an ocean wave coming over you uh, because, you know, you kind of have this, this, this feeling of constriction and then you have this feeling of release. And it's really nice to do this right before you go to bed. This is where um, a lot of people, pe people feel the accumulation of their stress, right, where they're just about to go to bed, they're laying in bed, and all of a sudden, all of these thoughts cross their mind, all of their to-dos come forward, and it's like, okay, I need to relax here. So maybe taking a hot bath before bedtime, doing the breathing, and then doing the progressive relaxation. I also put meditation on this list. Meditation is not for everybody, and it's, it's really, um, you know, many times we have a certain defined way of how we see meditation you know, being in that place of stillness and, and trying not to think about anything. But really, meditation means to, to be in that place of solitude, but it can be an active meditation. It can be a walk, a nature walk. It can be, um, you know, really painting or drawing or dancing or listening to music, anything that really puts you into that space of relaxation, right? It's the... Um, trying to be in the space of being rather than in the space of doing, but then using the space of doing to create that sense of being. I think that we can also uh, do that, as long as it's something that doesn't stress us, right? I think that that's most important. And then uh, yoga. I happen to uh, do yoga myself, and I have really found that simple stretches, certain yoga poses, nothing fancy. This doesn't mean that you have to get into a pretzel shape. This just means some very basic stretching because uh, many times our posture becomes constricted and bent. And so we might be hunched over, we might have caved shoulders, our spine might not, may not be straight. And so what yoga does is it brings us into awareness um, as it relates to our body posture. So one piece of this really um, is, is around exercise, too. And, you know, I dare to use the E word because people have their own associations with that. We can call it physical activity. We can call it movement therapy, whatever we want to call it. But it's one of those things that, in general, this can really help us with stress reduction. And if you do have more time off from work during the holidays, it might be worthwhile to fit in here and there whenever you can some moderate low intensity exercise because this could help with a lot of the stress hormones that are running around in the bloodstream. But you want to be sure that when you are exercising or active that you're choosing an activity that leaves you refreshed and energized, not something that depletes you. Sometimes we get so fixated on the type of activity uh, that we need to do and making sure that we fit it into our routine and in the end we just get more tired. And we don't want that from exercise, just like we don't want that from food. We really want to be sure that we're nourished and energized by that experience. So as you go through the holidays, uh, another thing to think about is getting enough sleep. I don't think we talk about this enough. Um, and it's something that is very readily overlooked. You need to get enough sleep in order to restore processes in the body. This is how your body recovers from stress. And if you're cutting it too short on sleep, 
um, chances are you, you just might um, be more stressed and, and even age your body faster. In fact, I always think it's very interesting when um, people are talking about how little sleep they need and how they're so proud that they only need five hours, four hours, and how much they get done. When really, um, you know, this, this may not be suitable long term, right? Um, the National Sleep Foundation talks about seven to nine hours as being the sweet spot of sleep. So I would really encourage you, especially while we have these dark nights, um, and, and really just having more of the nighttime hours to use those hours, going to bed early, getting that restorative sleep that we need. It's going to help you to function better and really just enjoy the holidays. When it comes to um, food, and we're going to focus most of our attention on this, of course, um, really to think about the, the different foods that you're used to eating and the foods that you're not used to eating. Um, there might be certain things that you have limits on like caffeine and alcohol. And as you go through the holidays, it might be that you start to drink more caffeinated beverages and drink more alcohol. So becoming aware of your limits there, um, if you've set certain limits for yourself, and just being aware of them. And I also think that if we're in an environment that's relaxed and we plan our meals, I, I really do, um, and I have noticed this with clients, um, with myself even, is that the more we can plan, the more we feel free. So if we're planning our list to go to the grocery store, we're planning all the things that we're planning to do over the holidays, and we have everything stacked up and have that sense of that vision, then it, uh, it really makes for more relaxation. And then um, key nutrients for stress. I would encourage you to work with your healthcare practitioner to figure out if you are um, sufficient in nutrients to get you through the holidays too. There are certain nutrients that help us with stress uh, hormone production, so really helping our adrenal glands to function during times of peak stress. So things like vitamin C, the B vitamins like pantothenic acid, which is vitamin B5, vitamin B6, and then some of the minerals like zinc and magnesium can be really important for establishing that baseline level of reducing stress. All right, well, that was a lot for the first holiday tip. Um, not all of them are so long, but I really wanted to focus on the number one uh, tip of reducing stress because, um, again, back to looking at the changes in our physiology that can happen during this time, your enjoyment of the season might be dependent on how well you're taking care of all of those aspects and helping to keep your stress in check. So the other tips are going to go um, much, much faster. So number two is if you are eating emotionally, look at what is eating you. And this is, um, so the holidays are not just a time of lots of different foods surrounding us, but also a flurry of emotional activity. They can bring up lots of emotions for us. In fact, um, just even working with people, I've noticed that uh, they express to me some of their concerns and um, emotional issues around the holidays, the expectations to have holidays be a certain way, having certain meals, having certain gifts exchanged. Um, and so it can bring up a lot of emotions about family, about getting together, uh, travel, all of those things. And so when we're not expressing emotions, what we might tend to do is to stuff them down, and that can be done many times with food. We might feel like it's more safe to stuff emotions down, have that sense of comfort through the food rather than expressing emotions. So really important to, to note whether or not emotions are driving our eating behavior. And we know that we can't necessarily control those emotions. It's a matter of being with them, transforming them, and, and really, um, I would say, setting aside time to, to really look at them and, and dialogue with them. You know, I always say that emotions are like unruly children. They demand attention, and, and they're a part of us. They're an extension of us. And so ignoring them is, is almost like, uh, you know, ignoring a symptom that we have in our body without really taking care of it and addressing it. We also um, project emotions onto foods for release, and, and foods represent certain emotions. So if you think about the holiday foods that you might be used to, um, certain foods might program certain emotions for you. 
So um, all I can say here is, is really to develop that awareness. And if you're working on your stress level, chances are you'll be much healthier in the way of expressing those emotions and, and being aware. Holiday tip number three, replacing mindless eating with mindful eating. So what does that mean exactly? Well, when we're really busy and we're distracted and we've got a lot going on, chances are we won't always be in the moment of eating with our, our, our sense of awareness, right? Um, our sense of being mindful. And uh, most people are truly doing something else when they're eating, whether they're watching television, uh, they're too busy to sit down and eat, so they're eating on the run, they're doing dashboard dining, they're eating while they're working. And what happens in this case, the reason why this is an issue is because we might end up eating more than we actually wanted to eat. So during the holidays, just imagine you're at social gatherings, talking to people, um, really being active. What might tend to happen is, is that we lose sense of this, um, our sense of fullness, right, and our sense of satiety and where we're at with food. So those little calories that we might be taking in um, in a mindless way might be adding up over the long term, which might be um, really taking us back to the, the projected increase in weight that we might see over the holidays, right? So I find this pretty staggering to think of just those little calories adding up, right? So let me just give you an example. If you had three jelly beans or one stick of gum per day that was additional, so that would only amount to 10 to 12 calories a day, but it would lead to about 4,380 calories or a little bit more than one pound of weight gain in a year. So what can happen is sometimes we go through the holidays, we start eating in a certain way, and then all of a sudden we, we continue. <laughs> we, we don't stop uh, eating certain foods. There were certain trigger foods that we latched onto, and we continued, and um, over time, what can happen again is that this starts to snowball, and we can start to see uh, the weight adding up. So here's just another small statistic that drinking a can of cola, 139 calories, would amount to 101,470 calories or 29 pounds over two years. Wow. So you can imagine that, um, you know, how you eat during this time it, it is temporary. You want it to be temporary and not really to be taking on a lot of these little calorie additions. Most people, you know, back to this idea of being mindful, most people, holidays or not, don't really have a good sense of how much they're eating. And it was very interesting in, in some surveys of people that were walking um, out of restaurants or, you know, just asking them after they've had a meal what they've eaten. Um, on average, people underestimate how much they've eaten. So normal weight people think they've eaten 20% less than they actually did. And people that are overweight and obese tend to underestimate by even more than that, 30 to 50%. So there really is a discrepancy between what we think we're eating and what we're actually eating, and most likely even more so during the holidays. In fact, there's this one very interesting study that was published in 2003, and this was five minutes after having dinner. So this wasn't even hours after. This is five minutes after dinner. 31% of people leaving an Italian restaurant couldn't remember how much bread they ate. And 12% of bread eaters deny that they had any bread at all. So isn't that remarkable that um, right after a meal, so you can imagine if you're um, really, you know, you, you let hours go by, you, you forget what you had, you don't have that sense of awareness. What I like to re recommend for people going through the holidays is a holiday lifestyle journal. Because when we're writing things down, and, you know, maybe that can be quick. It, it doesn't have to be laborious. We're writing all of the amounts of food in all the exquisite detail, but just a quick blip, you know, a little pocketbook that we carry around with us so that we do have a good sense. And at the end of the day, we can say to ourselves, oh, wow, you know, that's, that's all I had, or, oh, that, that was way too much, or, wow, I could have made better choices here or there. I'm going to do better tomorrow, right? 
So in, in some way, um, you know, developing that awareness is really key. Holiday tip number four is celebrate the eating experience. Yes, uh, and in fact, that's why we have the holidays, right? We're um, expressing gratitude, appreciation. We're really um, connecting to the generosity aspect if we do gift giving. So there's something really special about this time of year. And so if we can bring ourselves into the place of knowing that it's about the people and not the food, you know, what's the real reason behind the season kind of a thing, right? And really to um, enjoy your time. Because if you're in that place of enjoyment and pleasure, chances are you're not going to be in a place of stress. You're going to be in a place of relaxation. So there are many different things that you can do when it comes to food. And, and when you're eating, really paying attention to your senses as you're eating, um, not just your eyes. Many of us eat with our eyes. We select food based on our eyes. But what about using the hands in creative ways? Um, I don't know if any of you have heard me tell this story before, but one Thanksgiving meal, <laughs> I recall, you know, I wanted to do something different. And I thought, well, let's have fun with this. And when our guests come over, let's ask them if they would feel okay with not using our silverware, but using our hands to eat. And it will get really messy. We all know that. But it will be fun. It will be an experience and a Thanksgiving that we'll always remember. So we did that. We had turkey. We had potatoes. And we had carrots. And, you know, it was all very greasy and fun. But it was so memorable. And it just got us laughing. And, and it got us away from any kind of stigma or sense of apprehension about holidays, if there were any. So I think that that's always fun to do. In fact, I remember even growing up that my mom always had these very creative things that she asked um, uh, us kids to do. And she would have Thanksgiving projects and Christmas projects and, you know, doing research or bringing to the, the eating table, the, the dining room, you know, something new about eating. How do they eat in different cultures? And, um, and really exploring that. And so just trying something else out during the holidays, maybe in order for you this year. It will give you a new spin. It will lighten your load and, and really just give you a fresh look. So paying attention to colorful foods, foods that have a balance of tastes, the sweet, salty, bitter, and sour, and really being in that place of people. I think it's really important. Holiday tip number five, um, keeping an eye on food packaging. So this is when the marketers really get a hold on us, right? We go to the store. There are all kinds of specials that are um, on the shelves, and, and you know things are marked down, things are marked up. Um, some of the things that I would recommend uh, as seasonal strategies is really to um, make sure that we're not eating out of so many containers. It's just as simple as that. So the boxes, the cardboard, the, the metal, the, the packages of um, chips and, and uh, processed foods, right? And what the studies show is that when we eat with our hands in the bags, that we don't actually know how much we're eating. And when we're buying a lot of this snack food, chances are we're not going to have that same awareness. And, and chances are we're going to be buying bigger bags. We're going to be um, shopping to get deals because of the, the social gatherings, and we're going to have lots of these leftovers, right? So the goal here is um, if you can get smaller packages. So to try to plan more effectively if you are having a dinner party so that you just don't, you're not overflowing with leftovers because that is just so common, right? Um, what we see is that people eat more from larger packages. And if you have more food, you're going to eat more of it. It's just the nature of, um, of our psychology. So on average, people eat 20 to 25 percent more from larger packages. So this work um, comes from a couple of different experiments. There was an M&M experiment where people were given half a bag. It was a half a pound bag of M&Ms. And then they were given a one pound bag. And when they had half a pound bag, they ate less. They ate about 50 percent less M&Ms than when they had the one pound bag. So isn't that remarkable that just changing the bag size, and you know you can even think about this with gift giving or how much you put out in the way of snacks and such, right, if you're having a party or a gathering. There was also a spaghetti experiment. When people were given a large package of pasta, sauce, and meat, 
they typically prepared about 23% more, which equated to about 150 calories more than those given the medium packages. So again, packaging is everything. Just to keep your eye on that will be um, really important. And it's hard because we see the signs in the store, the promotions that would normally uh, not attract us, but now we're starting to see, you know, 100% more than we um, buy one, get one free, you know, all kinds of deals being um, talked about in, in a variety of uh, different places that we shop. So having that awareness wherever we are and, and knowing that your eyes are very powerful. If you're going to see the food, chances are you're probably going to eat it. And so, um, and also if you don't see the food and you have your hand in these bags uh, and you're not seeing the food, we, we don't have a, a good sense of, of what we're taking in. It's really interesting. Um, if you think about holiday foods and people displaying more candies, more treats, cookies in um, workplace lunchrooms and such, um, essentially the, the, the rule of thumb here is that the more hassle it is to eat, the less we eat. And when we have sweets in opaque containers, so containers that we can't see through, chances are if we don't see them, there'll be less uh, within our mind to, to actually go in and make the move to eat them. And these studies have been done. It's really interesting. So if you have um, food out and available for people, thinking about um, if you have unshelled nuts, people will tend to eat those more than shelled no, just the reverse. If they're, the nuts are shelled, they're easier. Nobody has to do any work to eat them versus unshelled nuts, right? A small thing, but, you know, it, it does build in a pause for us when we're eating. Chocolates on desks. Um, they actually did an experiment with secretaries and showed that um, when they had translucent containers, containers that they could see through, that more chocolates were eaten than when there were opaque containers. So, you know, our eyes can play tricks on us, and it's just good to be astute and um, a savvy shopper in, in many ways. So holiday tip number six is know when you've had enough and really knowing when you feel comfortable to stop eating. So um, it's very interesting, even the language that we cultivate around our eating occasions, especially during the holidays, right? You might hear typical phrases like, oh, I'm full, I'm stuffed. Right? That's, a, that's a common one, especially around Thanksgiving. Um, but, you know, do we necessarily want ourselves to get to that point? You know, what we really want is to have some ability to move after a meal. And, you know, the, the phrase of harahachi boo, eating until you're about 80% full, is, is probably ideal. No one has an exact gauge of what that looks like. You know, you have to determine that for yourself. But my rule of thumb is if you put your two hands together and you cup them, this is roughly the size of your stomach. So if you think about it, in any one sitting, how much you're eating, are you going beyond the actual um, the, the size of your stomach? How much are you stretching? How much are you stuffing? So note people's language during the holidays, um, the, the whole aspect of I'm full, I'm stuffed versus I am no longer hungry. So holiday tip number seven. Now here's where I'm going to vision out here with you a little bit more beyond the holidays because as we go through the holidays, we might find ourselves saying to ourselves, uh, oh, you know, New Year's resolution, I'll stop eating this food. Come January 1st, I'm going to have a whole new health kick, etc." So I figure while I have you for this, this talk on holidays, that perhaps I can plant this seed in you, uh, in your mind, of how do we choose lifestyle changes um, rather than diets at the turn of the, the new year, right? Because um, researchers have shown that only about 22% of New Year's diet resolutions make it to February. And this is where we get into the whole roller coaster of dieting. And sometimes that word diet itself brings up a lot of stress and it creates within us a different way of thinking. Whereas with lifestyle changes, really visioning ourselves out uh, into the new year, how do we want to transform? What do we want that's new and refreshing? So, um, you know, to be thinking about that because what we think about can become manifest. It can become matter. So at this point, I know it's early and we still have the holidays to get through, but 
I thought I would mention this because um, at some point you'll be thinking about this um, sometime at the end of December. And so really trying to focus more on lifestyle than the dieting. And the more that you can visualize how you see your health, the things that you're doing and feeling and um, eating, the chances are greater that you'll actually be doing those things. Holiday tip number eight, re-engineer your eating wear. And here, again, is where our eyes can play tricks on us. And this is where you can overcome a lot of those tricks, those illusions, by re-engineering what you're eating from, whether it's glasses, bowls, or plates. In fact, I think it's quite remarkable that 72% of our calories come from food that we eat from bowls, plates, and glasses. So the size is everything. If we have a big plate, just like the, um, the amount of food that's presented to us, chances are we're going to eat more. So if we have smaller plates, we may tend to eat less or something in the middle. If we have a uh, tall, skinny glass, we may think that we're actually getting more than if we were drinking from a short, wide glass, but that's considering uh, if both of them contain the same amount, right? If we looked at both, a short, wide glass and a tall, skinny glass, we may actually think that we're getting more from the tall, skinny, even though they have the same amount of fluid. So even looking at our glasses um, is, is something to uh, pay attention to. And I would even say silverware. Um, in fact, I, I just have noticed that silverware has been, I don't know, it, it's becoming monstrous. Uh, it's becoming larger and larger, which means bigger and bigger bites. Um, and so really trying to, to find ways to downscale, to have the smaller plates, to have the tall skinny glasses, and even to have smaller silverware, uh, and maybe even for fun, chopsticks, if you're not used to eating with chopsticks because they can slow us down. So if you're seeing my screen, uh, what you'll see here is uh, two white dots. And I would ask you uh, which of the dots is bigger. And the, the correct answer is that they're both the same size. They're surrounded by black dots that vary in shape. Um, in one scenario, the black dots look smaller, and they are. And the, in the other one, the black dots are bigger. So this is actually the optical illusion of the plate, right? So if you have a little bit of food, which is represented by the white dot, it, on a smaller plate, it will be telling your brain to some extent, there will be that psychological environmental cue that you're getting more versus when you have a larger plate with a smaller amount of food, which is actually the same amount of food that you would have had on the smaller plate, right? So again, another optical illusion. So hopefully what you're getting from this is as it relates to the holidays, the, the change in the season with more socializing, to mini size boxes and bowls, buying smaller plates, using small pieces of silverware. And the good thing is that you can use all of this past the holidays. In fact, you might want to even think about uh, changing up the sizes of things in your cupboards at home, right? And perhaps that's part of your New Year's resolution is establishing uh, your kitchen as a sanctuary, a place where you like to be, where you're cultivating a good, healthy relationship with food. All right, so let's dive a, a bit deeper now into the actual foods um, and, and to talk about some ideas of what you might want to introduce either at uh, the holiday meals that you will be hosting and holding or maybe even as part of a potluck, things that you can bring. So some of the things that I think about would be um, definitely leafy greens whenever, at all possible um, options. <laughs> Bringing in those leafy greens. You know, the, the research studies show us that when we uh, couple leafy greens to foods that are grilled, um, overly cooked, uh, or fried, that we can help to blunt some of the effects of those um, more inflammatory foods. So leafy greens are fantastic, and my preference is always to choose bitter, astringent greens like arugula, um, because those bitters have their own medicinal qualities as well and may help us with things like metabolism. Vegetable soup instead of pasta. You know what's re remarkable about this? So um, there was actually a study looking at vegetable soup and look, well, actually, I think it was chicken soup versus chicken casserole. 
And they found that when people ate the chicken soup versus the casserole, that they ate slower. Of course, they had to, right, because it's soup and it requires many bites and it's, it's warm or hot. So you have to take your time. It's almost like the pause is built in. So having this soup led to less calories consumed at the next meal compared to the casserole, which was the same amount of calories as the soup, only it was in a different format. It was in a, of course, a more solid format, and you can imagine that after a couple of bites, you're done with that casserole. So I love soups around the holidays for that very reason, because it builds in the pause. It gets us to eat slower. And um, when it's colder outside, just from a Chinese medicine perspective, our digestion, you know, depending on our body type and many other factors, sometimes we need something warm inside. It may help us with digestion uh, when we've cooked foods more, breaking down their structure, leaving us less to have to do on the inside. So uh, definitely preferred instead of pasta. You know, I would definitely see that as a better choice, better for the glycemic impact. I love vegetable platters with some kind of dip, right? And I'm, when I'm saying dip, I'm not thinking of the sour cream type of dip. I'm thinking like a bean dip, a hummus dip. Uh, in fact, even at Trader Joe's, they have the edamame um, hummus, which is really interesting. It's a soybean type of dip. Um, or even a yogurt, a plain unsweetened yogurt that has been seasoned with dill or other spices. So this could be something that you always have at a social gathering, right? It's something that um, it's great finger food. Uh, it's easily refillable. You know it's healthy. Um, and, and people seem to gravitate towards vegetable platters. They, they will be, and if you do have leftovers, and let's just say that you do have a crowd that is not gravitating to that vegetable platter, well, goodness gracious, you have a bunch of those vegetables left over, which is um, even better. So, I, and I think that they're, they're relatively easy to prepare, right? If you have these, either you can buy one already pre-made at the store, or you can cut up a bunch of veggies on your own um, and, and then just have them in your refrigerator so that you're constantly replenishing. Um, the next thing I have on the list is sweet potatoes and broccoli instead of mashed potatoes. Um, the sweet potatoes here, why would I choose sweet potatoes instead of mashed potatoes? Well, sweet potatoes are going to be higher in different phytonutrients, things like beta carotene, and um, they, they just have a different glycemic impact than things like mashed potatoes, although that will de be determined by what you have in those mashed potatoes. But in general, potatoes, the white, golden, starchy ones, are going to have a greater glycemic impact. And then it's also about what we add to those mashed potatoes. Are we adding lots of milk, butter, um, and, and lots of other fats, right? So I like the idea of sweet potatoes because it gives us color, it gives us phytonutrients, and of course I'm adding in that broccoli there because I like to see greens when at all possible. Now, if, if you really like mashed potatoes, um, there are some options that get pretty close to those mashed potatoes. First of all, I might think about purple potatoes that can be mashed, or even um, the, the small fingerling golden potatoes that, that also, they're going to be a little bit more dense and a little bit harder to mash, but in general, they're going to be better than that white, fluffy, russet potato um, that will just be a lot of starch, right? So you can make some good conscious mashed potatoes, absolutely. And using olive oil um, would be a good choice. Tossing in some garlic, maybe a little bit of coconut milk um, or some other type of uh, dairy alternative could also be very interesting. But there is another um, type of recipe that you can make, um, and that's mashed cauliflower. In fact, I believe the exact recipe, um, if I'm thinking about it, where, where I have it, it's called I Can't Believe It's Not Mashed Potatoes. And what you do is you take the cauliflower head and you break it apart into florets and you um, get it soft by boiling it, right, just a, a bit soft and um, so it gets kind of mushy. And then you take those florets into a blender or food processor together with whether you want coconut milk, some type of dairy alternative, or even milk itself if that's what you choose to, to drink and, and to incorporate. In conjunction with, um, I like olive oil and garlic and spices. And when you blend it up and it's warm, 
it tastes so much uh, like mashed potatoes. The key is that it has to be warm. <laughs> it won't taste the same if it's cold. I've had that experience. So see if uh, you, you can't um, try something new this holiday season. If, if you really like mashed potatoes, going for something that's a little bit more um, uh, nutritious and, and healthy on that phytonutrient scale. And then what about meats? Of course, um, if you choose meats, the best choices would be those that are free-range, grass-fed, leaner cuts of meat, right? And um, I remember one year in our, in our neighborhood here, because we live in more of a rural area, um, we have a farmer, and it was great because uh, he was able to, um, you know, have for us a turkey, and that turkey was free-ranging and in his fields. Um, and it's just nice to know where your food comes from, right? And um, just having respect for for the locally uh, oriented businesses and people that are, are growing in your own area, it might be nice to support them and even think about that uh, this holiday season. Also, um, I might mention that um, various places like Whole Foods and such have options where you can advanced order certain cuts of meat um, that are, again, free-range and grass-fed. So there are options there. And then what about dessert? <laughs> well, um, yes, uh, in incorporating something like the sweet potato or yam and or pumpkin, one of my favorites is to take one of those um, root vegetables or starchy vegetables, the orange ones, mash them up, incorporate cinnamon. In fact, I'm going to take you through a recipe that I have in here. But um, it's wonderful because it tastes like a great side for the main course, but it could also be a dessert. Uh, you could sweeten it up with brown rice syrup, with honey, um, adding a little bit more if it's a dessert. Another dessert that I have made in the past that I'm so fond of, and they even have it at Harmony Hill now, is a key lime avocado pie. Now, is avocado tasty as a dessert when it's made into a pie? Believe it or not, uh, it can be done, and it tastes delicious. Um, having the lime, the um, I, I believe I used maple syrup with the avocado, coconut oil, and then I used a pressed ground nut crust. So it's really wonderful. If you're interested in it, make sure you contact us, and we can give you the recipe for that. In fact, I, all of this material can be made available to you if you email me and, and we can send this out, this, this whole PowerPoint even. So let's just look at an example of um, comparing and contrasting two different meals. And I'm not advocating one or the other per se. Um, I'm just showing that there can be a difference in the amount of calories that are taken in and, and based on the choices that we make, right? So looking even at... Um, the, the meat that we choose, we can modify that depending on if we have the skin on the meat or not. That adds another layer of fat. Uh, and we know that many of the endocrine disruptors, the, um, the different toxins in the environment, do store in the fat of animals. So one more reason to, um, to be pretty conscious about omitting the skin on meats. Uh, and I know that there are different theories about that, but uh, in general, if you if you're not so sure about the meat source, um, it might be better just to omit fat um, when, when possible. And then looking at um, the, the type of carbohydrate, right? So you can choose mashed potatoes, which would give you, with gravy, of course, right? That would give you about 217 calories. Or you can have a baked potato with one teaspoon of, in this case, they chose margarine. Um, I'm not necessarily a fan of of either of those two scenarios. I think you can even go to a, a better choice. And, you know, this, this whole thing about counting calories, I don't think that that is oh so important, but it is good to have some awareness. You know, I think if you eat healthy, you don't have to think so much about calories. When you're not eating healthy, then you might need to think a little bit more about those calories, right? So um, carrots, having cooked carrots instead of candied yams, gosh, the difference there in calories is, is immense. So the candied yams are at uh, 168 calories, and the cooked carrots, one cup is 45, 45 calories. So, you know, quite a difference here depending on our everyday choices. 
Now, as you go through the holidays, you might have some cravings for sweets. That's completely normal, right? Um, in fact, we, you might have and engage in some type of sweet offering, and what that can do is jumpstart you and set you down the path of, of more cravings. So what I typically recommend for something like that is to go with fruit. Fruit helps to stave off hunger and helps with sweet cravings. I think berries are the best for their glycemic impact and also because they tend to be pretty satisfying. And the newer research shows that frozen blueberries are as nutritionally dense as fresh ones, unless, of course, you actually have a blueberry bush at your home and you go out and pick them fresh and eat them right away. But if you're buying fresh blueberries from the grocery store or you're buying frozen, they tend to be pretty comparable. So that might be a good addition to think about for the holidays. So um, I thought what I would do, I just thought that this is very interesting, um, of course, and, and I'm not, again, advocating any of these recipes per se. What I'm advocating is the creative expression through these recipes and how you can seemingly disguise really healthy things within foods that may not always look nutritious, right? Like I'll give you an example just off the top of my head, black bean brownies, right? If you don't tell anybody that it's made from black beans and people know that those are brownies, gosh, you could be getting an incredible amount of fiber and different phytonutrients um, with those brownies. Um, and, you know, they're, they're much higher quality than just making brownies from a mix where you have the flour and lots of sugar and oil and egg. So I, I'm just posing that concept out to you of how you can be creative. And the more creative you are with your food preparation, the more, again, you'll be expressing and, you know, it's just a great conduit, especially during the holidays when things get pent up and constricted and lots of frustration. So there's this book called Deceptively Delicious by Jessica Seinfeld. Yes, she's the, the wife of Jerry Seinfeld. Um, and she has these recipes, and again, I'm not necessarily advocating this book, but I like her idea here. She has this one recipe, um, scrambled eggs with cauliflower. So very interesting, right, taking um, eggs, and she puts in cauliflower puree. And most people aren't going to notice that, but they are getting some additional uh, phytonutrients there. She had some others in her book that I thought were neat, too, like um, quesadillas with butternut squash. She had chocolate cake with beets. And beets are um, actually quite easy to incorporate into foods, into baked products. They don't have a strong taste. They're fairly neutral, just like spinach. Spinach you can put into just about, well, most things. I'm sure that there are some things that spinach doesn't go into, but you can put it into a smoothie fairly easily. It blends in well, and it's fairly tasteless. So she also has brownies with carrots and spinach, pancakes with sweet potato, blueberry oatmeal bars with spinach. You see how she uses spinach a lot? <laughs> <laughs> and then even macaroni and cheese with butternut squash or cauliflower puree. So, um, you know, there might be some traditional dishes that you'd like to make, but you'd like a different spin, and you want to try something else out. So keep those in mind. The sweet potato works, cauliflower puree works, spinach is also a great one. All right, so um, let's just uh, briefly, um, as we think about these different foods and the different gatherings, uh, just to, to quickly talk about how to maximize your experiences socially. Um, I, I do think that bringing in, this is kind of my, my little secret, that if I want something really rich and decadent, I try to have it with something that I know is really nourishing and very nutritious. Right? Um, it's back to this example of having a hamburger by itself or having a hamburger with half of an avocado changes the whole dynamic of that meal. It offsets the inflammation that normally would be experienced by eating that hamburger alone. So keep that in mind that, you know, you might not always be perfect in, in what you're going to eat, but if you can bring in something that is nutritious somewhere along the way as part of that eating, you might be better off for it. So color, color, color. And if you're sitting um, at a long dinner table, um, one little subtle thing that you can do is to try to be the last person to start eating. Now, why would I mention that? Because 
many people, uh, you know, you're going to sit at that table for as long as the meal um, is is going on, right? So if it's a long, drawn-out meal, you're going to be sitting there longer. If it's a shorter meal, everybody's going to be up and about. So if you're the last person to start eating, the time that you're spending at the table will be less than for most people, which means that chances are you probably won't be engaging in seconds, right? And Or if you're not the, the last person to start eating, pace yourself at the slowest eater at the table. That works too. Um, if you're at a party and you are bringing some of these snacks, gravitate to the ones that are um, really good. You like the vegetable platter, really um, a good thing. And keep yourself you know, um, out of sight, out of mind, right? So if you're talking with people away from those snacks or if you are close to snacks, just see if you can gauge where, um, where you need to be. Where are those healthy snacks? If you're at a restaurant, um, some of the, the strategies here for holiday meals is one thing that you can think about right away is the bread, right? Because we know that many people eat bread very mindlessly, and so not having the bread and, and perhaps having some more of something else. Maybe it's more of the cooked vegetables that everybody can share. So and one thing that I like to do, especially around the holidays, is to share desserts. Um, I, I think it's it's really nice. It's it's just a great way to again have that sense of community and not feel like you're overdoing it. So when it comes to dinners, making them uh, again more delightful, we talked about some strategies. I'm I'm just kind of summarizing them for you here. Pre-plating those high calorie foods in the kitchen so that you're not going back for seconds. It's not sitting on the table. Using smaller plates and taller glasses. And believe it or not, I find this fascinating, that music, music played in a restaurant or even during dinner can change the pace of your eating. So slow music is going to help slow you down, just like the music, right? Um, faster music, more jovial music, that might change your, your eating behavior. So just note that. The more variety you have, chances are the more you will want to sample. So not going to all the buffets and all the uh, – sometimes a potluck can be good because everybody's bringing things, but it can also uh, – <laughs> depending on how many people you have at that potluck, you could have a lot of different dishes. And, of course, you want to try everybody's dish because they're all waiting for you to try. So, you know, it's just taking a little bit of, of everything rather than, uh, you know, just gauging your portions there. All right, and, and thinking about the actual, here's another little, um, I don't know if it, you would call it a secret or a, kind of a trick or an illusion, um, is to really think about volume. Whenever you're making foods in the different recipes, even if it's that mashed cauliflower, the more volume you make it, um, the, the ch chances are the, the, the greater the volume it has without more substance and more calories, then people will, will tend to eat that certain amount, right? Because every day, whether or not we realize it, we kind of aim for a certain amount of food. You know, we, we kind of do go on volume. And so if we're building in more air or we're putting in more vegetables, which have a lot of fiber and not a lot of calories, chances are we're going to stay with that amount of food and not overeat necessarily. So um, I just think it's a very interesting concept called volumetrics from Dr. Barbara Rolls, um, and, and I really like that idea of incorporating more air. Um, if you do need to go to the store, one thing, and I'll, I'll just mention this, I didn't mention it earlier, is to bring a list. I think it's really important to bring a list because, again, we can be distracted and start to see things in the store that um, – that we may not, might not have bought before, um, but because we're not working from the list, we're, we're more distracted, more apt to buy those things. And also, I like to stick to the perimeter, right, um, because the perimeter is going to have more of the whole foods, less of the processed foods, and again, back to reducing our consumption of things in bottles, bags, boxes, cans. All right, um, so... When it, when it comes to focusing on, uh, on the people, we, we did talk about this. One of the things that I did one year is um, with my family is we had a homemade Christmas. And it really did change the focus of our holidays. We focused on 
the stories. We, we told stories about the things that we made for each other. We set an intention. Everybody had their own intention. So, you know, it might be nice to think about that um, going into the holidays. Again, how would you like these to be different? So lots of different um, tips here in, in the way of, of your eating. And to close on some, some of the exact recipes, I, I talked about some general ideas for foods. But um, let's go deeper and, and close in this next seven minutes with some more specific recipes. I'm actually just going to show you these recipes and just speak to them. These are some of my favorites. And in fact, uh, you can get all of these recipes. I have them on my website. Uh, under recipes. They're all free. You just uh, click the button and you can download the recipes. And this is from the Nourish Your Whole Self recipe packet. I believe we have another one on there which is for heart health. This one is the, the Nourish Your Whole Self recipe packet. And a lot of these recipes are in my book, Chakra Foods. So one of my favorites is the Cinnamon Nut Baked Apple. Really, really easy. Um, the, the only time-consuming piece of this is coring the apple. But what you're doing is you're creating a nut mixture, cashews, pecans, and taking some dates. Dates are very, they're super sweet. So um, you cut them into pieces, you put them together with the nuts. This is actually how I make my nut crust when I'm making the key lime avocado pie. I'm taking all of that, I'm putting it in a food processor, and I'm um, making it very fine, kind of like mincemeat, right? And then I'm taking that, putting that together with unsweetened coconut flakes, cinnamon. I love using cinnamon during the holidays, not just because it has kind of that emotional holiday resonance, but because it actually helps us to respond better to insulin in our body, which helps us with blood sugar balance. So cinnamon is really great for that. Um, honey. And then what you do is you take this mixture and you put it into the core where, where you've cored out the apple drizzle the apples with a little bit of apple juice concentrate, and then you, um, you bake them uncovered in the oven until they get a bit soft. Right? Depending on the size of the apple, if you have a really big apple, it might take a little bit longer. It might take 40 minutes. If you have a smaller apple, uh, it might take a little bit less. So just note that. But it's a wonderful, it smells so good. It really makes the house very holiday um, aromatic. Um, it, it really pervades the house. It's really nice. Now, I mentioned I like soups a lot. Um, this is the nourishing bean soup. Beans are wonderful from the standpoint of getting protein and fiber. They're going to make you feel more full. So what I like about this is because um, you are bringing lots of different beans together. And you can mix and match and have your own favorite beans uh, in this soup. But when you're cooking the beans, you'll also make them a bit more digestible for those of you who might have issues with bloating or not being able to tolerate beans as well. So cooking the soup, keeping it warm, and then including some vegetables into that is wonderful. And again, great as an appetizer before a main course of a holiday meal. Grilled salmon with apricot orange sauce and baby carrots. Can you get any more orange than that? Right? You've got the salmon. And I like, of course, the wild salmon. Uh, where I live in the Pacific Northwest, it's fairly easy to get. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of concerns about heavy metals and fish. So, again, um, making sure that you do have a good source. The Environmental Working Group has a, a great site on, um, you know, kind of a, a download of the high mercury-containing fish and lower mercury-containing fish. But anyway, creating this sauce with apricot preserves, teriyaki sauce, and they do have teriyaki sauce without gluten, vinegar, ginger, sesame oil, orange juice, orange zest, and then um, the, the baby carrots. You know, all of that, just having that mixture, pouring it all over the fish, cooking it. You know, this might be something to, to try. You know, many times we get into the mode of kind of the traditional meats. And we don't think about things like fish, but fish definitely fits within, um, the, it can fit within a holiday meal. Here's another very orange um, recipe, creative carrot curry soup. I call it the three C soup. And as um, many of you have heard me say before, if I was stranded on a desert island, I definitely would want turmeric. And turmeric is part of curry powder. It's such a great anti-inflammatory. So it's really good. If you're thinking of, oh gosh, I can't get sick during the holidays, um, getting more turmeric, getting that curry, sprinkling it on different things, actually making it curry soup, 
is a really neat idea, and it will keep you warm just internally. It has kind of that inherent heat property, right? It, it's very warming as a spice. Here's the yam pecan bake that I spoke to before. I, I spoke about sweet potatoes, but if you take yams, um, I've made this with yams, you cook them, take off their skins, mash them up, put them together with like coconut milk, um, honey, or your favorite sweetener of choice, hopefully a natural one, uh, pecans, coconut, cinnamon, nutmeg. This is so tasty, and again, it's almost like a dessert. You could have this as a dessert. You might have to adjust the sweetener a little bit, but it's fabulous. The, the yams themselves are very sweet. Quinoa amaranth pine nut salad, also great if you're looking for some alternate grains. So moving away from a lot of the gluten grains, um, barley, rye, oat, wheat, and spelt, and trying some of the alternate grains. Um, I like this one because it's light in some ways. You know, it has the feeling of more of a fresh, a grain salad, but yet you're getting some pretty decent amount of protein here because of the quinoa. So this is nice, and it can be served cold or warm. Heartwarming Brussels sprouts. <laughs> Why did I put Brussels sprouts in here? Because uh, it, it seems to be not a very popular food, but I think it can be made more popular depending on how we're preparing it. Taking the Brussels sprouts and cooking them really well um, you know, I didn't put it here, but using pomegranate seeds and making a pomegranate seed sauce, a light sauce together with the Brussels sprouts can be fabulous. It's a great color complement. Um, the two tastes work really well together. But we're really um, just trying out Brussels sprouts in new ways. You know, getting them soft, grilling them slightly, uh, they can be very tasty. It's, and they're so incredibly medicinal. All right, I know that every one of these recipes, I'm making it sound like it's my favorite, and <laughs> perhaps that's why I'm showing you this particular segment, because I like all of these. The ginger spice bread, um, this is definitely a holiday um, type of cake. Um, I, you know, it's not a cake in the traditional sense, but it is kind of cake-like, I must say. Even though I'm calling it a bread, it's not really a bread in the sense of like a loaf. It's more like... Um, kind of reminds me of uh, just kind of like brownies, but a bit more light. And it's, it definitely is very spice heavy. So I love it for that reason. It's got cardamom, ginger, cinnamon, nutmeg. Um, and I usually put even a, a little bit more spice as I'm measuring these out because I really like it to be very spicy. Um, so it's fantastic. And you can make this. I've made this recipe before for people that, um, well, if I'm following an elimination diet, I talk with patients about following this particular recipe and substituting the eggs out and putting in egg replacer. It works just fine. So if you can't do eggs and you're thinking, oh, gosh, you know, I'd like to try this, but I can't, you can do this with egg replacer. You can try this with alternate sweeteners. works just fine. In fact, um, I even tried this recipe without the agave nectar, and I put in applesauce uh, in place of that and um, some apple juice. I already have apple juice in here, but just a little bit more, and it turned out great as well. All right, uh, just two more recipes. Um, berry Wisdom Seeker Cobbler, because berries are so important for us and we get too few of the blue-purple foods and compounds, and they're very medicinal for the brain and also for the heart. They help our blood vessels to open. So um, this is a very easy recipe, um, almost too easy. It, it probably would take you 10 minutes to put together, and it just takes long to cook. But again, it's one of those things that creates a great aroma in the house. Um, it involves blueberries, and I put blackberries in here too, together with some sweetener, brown rice flour, and some organic butter. And basically, it's, it's very similar to a crumble. So you could have this um, even as an adjunct at a breakfast, uh, perhaps. And then um, finally, well, actually, I, I take that back. I, I have this one, and then I will just quickly show you two other ones which are not in that same recipe packet. Um, this one is called Divine Cleansing Broth. So when you go through the holidays, um, you know, come January 1st, and you're really feeling like a cleanse is in order, and you really like to get clean and just have a, a reset, I put this recipe in here for that very reason. It's a wonderful cleansing broth. Um, some people make bone broths, which can be nice too. Um, and this one is without any animal products. This is just uh, using vegetables. And parsley, parsley, I predict, 
is going to get more and more recognition. It's incredibly high in lutein. It's on the order of what you would get with kale. So um, I'm really exploring more ways to use parsley. I think it's really neat. And then almond milk, no eggnog. So um, this comes from a friend of mine, Wendy Alfaro, who um, gave me her recipe. I modified it slightly. Um, I think it's fantastic using a, uh, a Vitamix to put together almond milk, coconut milk, figs, or um, I might put in dates. I have made this before, kind of what I call a turmeric milkshake, where I put in um, dates and the spices and a little bit of, um, I don't actually need any honey in this case because the dates suffice. And then um, I believe this is the last one, the chia pudding. Now, this is something I just happened upon recently. Uh, my husband was gifted with a huge bag of chia seeds, and we were saying to ourselves, gosh, what are we going to do with all this chia? And so a friend of mine, Barb Schultz, um, who's also a nutritionist, she said, why don't you make pudding? If you like tapioca pudding, this is a great substitute. So all she did, she came over and we made it. She took one cup of chia seeds, uh, and chia is great because it's high in fiber and omega-3 fats, and those are the anti-inflammatory fats. We put that together. In our case, we, we did coconut milk, but I would recommend using a not the chunky, full-fat coconut milk because that's all we had. Use something that flows because you want your pudding to kind of flow rather than be chunky, right? Whatever the consistency is of the milk that you choose will be the consistency of the pudding. Um, we used a little bit of maple syrup, and she just told me recently that she learned that maple syrup has fructooligosaccharides, which um, are prebiotics. There, that's um, essentially good, healthy food for your bacteria and your gut. Not a reason to overdo it on maple syrup, but just one other nice added benefit. Uh, a little bit of salt, a little bit of vanilla, and some cinnamon, and it's basically you can eat it pretty much straight away. It doesn't take long to make, and it's really nice if you do like things like a tapioca pudding. It's going to have a lot of texture, and it will get viscous. It's really nice. It does keep in the refrigerator for some time. So with that, uh, I apologize, I went a little bit over, but I just wanted to thank you for being part of this, uh, this webinar this evening, and I do wish you an incredibly healthy, nourishing holiday season, and hopefully there will be some things that you can take away from all of this information that will help you to, to be in that healthy, nourishing space. And again, uh, feel free to email and, uh, and, and let us know that you'd like the, the PowerPoint and the recipes, and we'd be glad to get those out to you. Thanks so much.